All right. Um, hi, everybody. Today is Tuesday, September the 5th. Uh, this is the publicly recorded weekly meeting of SIG testing. Um, all right. So, uh, Tim St. Clair, did you want to start us off? You had a question about squirrel brain. I forgot already. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I had a question whether or not anyone had started the upgrade test process. Right. Um, so I am not the uh, test person for the release team. Um, I anticipate we'll have more clarity on that at tomorrow's burn down meeting. Uh, if I had to guess, I'm still catching up on scroll back, right? But it looks like maybe the release 1.8 branch hasn't been cut yet. I know if you go to test period right now, there aren't release 1.8 specific dashboards. Um, so on that basis, I would anticipate that there's probably not upgrade testing to 1.8 specifically. Um, there are the master upgrade tests in the release blocking tab. Um, so I know that tests are running and I see pretty much all of them appear to be failing. Um, is that sort of what you were referencing there, Tim? No, uh, I was referencing specifically the upgrade test scenario because that's always the conundrum whenever new features are added. There's like this backport version skew things when APIs get promoted and everything else. And that's when things break pretty tremendous, you know, in, in very subtle, interesting ways. And it's proven itself to be a thorn in the side. Uh, yes. I think we're kind of at the, <laughs> maybe Jace can speak more to this. Uh, he's He lived through the excitement of the weekend. Um, I gather that we're at a crawl, walk, run phase here of making sure we have a set of tests that are consistently passing and provide good signal for the 1.8 release. So we don't yet have the 1.8 release branch, so there's that. If we go by the release master blocking list of tests, uh, many of the tests that are not upgrade tests, uh, most of them GKE related, aren't uh, passing right now. And then if I look at the master upgrade tests, it seems like um, those stopped, a lot of those stopped running around September 2nd on test period. So I would expect we probably have some work to do there. Um, so when we get to the point where we've got consistent signal elsewhere and we've got the 1.8 branch created, we'll, we'll probably be uh, paying attention to that. But I think we have enough other things that aren't working as anticipated at the moment. Did I accurately summarize that, Chase? Very well done, sir. That is exactly correct. And we're trying to do not uh, eat the whale all at once. Uh, so there's plenty of uh, things that we're trying to fix just the interim. Plus some of the core tests, like the COPS stuff is not working. And it's just, <laughs> this weekend was really quite quite a, an endurance marathon, actually. So we're just trying to get ourselves collected and get this stuff fixed. Okay, cool. So so Tim, I think maybe the, the short answer to your question is if you want to find out more about upgrade test status, um, we're at the point in the release process where there are burn down meetings on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, if I remember right. I'm trying to look at my calendar right now. That is correct. The next one is tomorrow. We, we were supposed to have one yesterday, but because the holiday, we didn't. So it's more that the. Right. So, inaugural burn down meeting tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific. And I believe if you don't have the invite for that, you can contact one of us offline. We can make sure we get that to you. And we will uh, bird dog that along with the rest of the release related stuff. Um, okay, uh, next question. I see there's an, uh, an item on the agenda here. I think Justin, you added this about um, valid build IDs for test grid. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Yes, there is. So, uh, as part of this weekend's fun, one of the things I was trying was to try to get federated results in, and it seems that test grid uh, has limitations that are different from what on the build ID from what bootstrap.py will generate. And so, I was trying to figure out what those what those build IDs were, but also like if there was any way I could figure that out for myself, because like it seems that the test grid code is not publicly available. Is that true? Yes, there are components of test grid that are not open source. Um, 
the majority of it, unfortunately. But I, is there a reason for that, or I mean, uh, this is essentially a tool that has started as Google internal only, and um, it didn't actually become publicly accessible for consumption until about sometime last year. Uh, and we're just at the point right now where people can edit that um, YAML file through pull requests to get their results included. Um, yeah. So I unfortunately, like, I'm just not intimately familiar with the code to be able to answer your question off the top of my head. But I think, like, I mean, yeah, I found an I found an issue. So hopefully, the relevant person will pick that up. I think it, it would be great if we could, even if the test grade code isn't going to be open source in the sense that like it welcomes contributors to be able mm -hmm. to. Be so I mean, just to speak to that, I can say that long term, we would love to open source it. Uh, I think it's sort of a question of resources and priorities from within Google at the moment. But that we recognize that that is certainly a component of the full like Kubernetes test in for stack that isn't open source yet. Um, it's just a matter of getting resources inside of Google that can work on that. Yeah, I mean, I would say that like even, even if it's like that it uses some proprietary library to just like carve that off and just like say, here is a dump of the code that is not proprietary, because then if someone wanted to re-implement it, they could do so. Right. Uh, uh, what's, what's, uh, Justin, what, what issue was that that you filed? I pasted a link in the doc. It is 4362 in test infra. Yeah, so you're populating a bucket and putting them someplace, and yeah, you're not sure if you have the right pattern or maybe you need to update a test grid config or something. So. Uh, well, I've discovered that it does work with limited numbers, and I don't know what I'm allowed and what I'm not allowed. Okay, so maybe this is a documentation fix. Um, I'm like I said, I'm still paging stuff back in, but I think I might know who to uh, get this off to. So hopefully we can get you a response within 24 hours. Thank you. Okay, um, Steve. Uh, okay, Steve, uh, so last week we had sort of an impromptu discussion around Gubernator and uh, potentially people outside of Google using or extending or forking or whatnot uh, Gubernator. And I was wondering if you could give, give us a summary of, of that meeting from Friday. Yep, sure. Um, I pasted a link to notes that Eric uh, wrote up for us while we were doing it in, in the meeting doc. But I think generally what came out of that was right now, Gubernator is hosted on Google App Engine. There's a, a lot of good stuff that that gives us as a PaaS, uh, and there's low priority to port that to uh, Kubernetes native application. Also, it seems like um, there's Ryan and Eric are both happy with the scope of Gubernator being a little bit larger and having Gubernator know how to serve results from different organizations. Um, and in the future, that might look like a CNCF owned instance that similar to the federation that you can do with test grid, you can say, okay, here is my GCS bucket. Um, maybe here's some of the branding that I would put on my page and then it'll uh, serve up your, your stuff for you. Um, so I guess that, that's the general overview from, from that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because I know at one point, I believe you and some folks from Red Hat were working on what, what about like forking our own instance of Gubernator that we can run on our own app engine and, um, and that the flexibility there is maybe you have a slightly different workflow or set of conventions than... Yeah, I think one of the things that we gained, uh, right now we're still sort of inching our way away from Jenkins, and so like a really salient point where we actually put a link to the Jenkins logs on Gubernator, on our version of Gubernator that we've deployed, whereas in Google's Gubernator, that's kind of expressly not something they want to do. So I think in the future, our fork will go away. Um, I'm working right now to upstream all the configuration bits to make it so that we don't have to have any, any potential code there. Um, and it, it, we may continue to deploy our own instance on our own account, but 
at least it'll be possible if we wanted to, to use one larger instance. I think right now there were some issues with the specific App Engine account that was being used. I'm not really sure. There was some, like, it wasn't possible to transfer ownership right now of the credentials and stuff for the current instance to CNCF. There were some logistical problems with that. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's owned by Google.com. Uh, Google project, I think, which is the same issue we have for like adding non-Googlers to be able to um, see the GKE cluster that runs like Prow and things of that nature. Um, so the long-term hope is that we can transfer ownership of this to like cncf.io if just in domain name only, um, potentially funding. If that makes sense. So like Istio is following the pattern we might see other projects use going forward where they just uh, the Gubernator code base was modified to allow their buckets and stuff to be consumed. And we're essentially like, Prow substitutes, if, if we talk about like wanting to get rid of Jenkins dearly and desperately, um, Prow sort of replaces the triggering and running of tests bit, but it doesn't provide anything in the way of display of your logs and artifacts. And that's largely what we use Gubernator for. So at the lowest level, it's like put all your artifacts in Google Cloud buckets and you could just link to that. But Gubernator is a little bit smarter and starts to like parse the actual logs, detect failures. Um, thanks to some of the stuff Clayton did a little while ago, it, it counts the number of tests and, and things like that. Um, so like it being the grand unified way of viewing all of the test artifacts that are full uh, stack of test infrastructure uh, provides seems like it could be cool. I sometimes wonder in the back of my head if it's going to be a little too tightly locked to the conventions that the Kubernetes project uses. Um, as we expand it out to other projects, we may find that, I don't know, uh, that people may want to make their sausage a little bit differently or follow slightly different conventions. Um, I think there have been issues in the past with resource exhaustion for the actual um, app engine instance running Gubernator. Yeah, and I, I think there's a couple changes that could be made to potentially how Gubernator's interacting with the, with the build logs, um, especially some of the tests that we run, for instance, aren't super well behaved and generate 25 megabytes of output. And right now that means, you know, you're expanding either five lines or, you know, 65,000 at a time, and that's not super great. Um, so there's definitely some growing pains that we might see as we get more projects using the same Gubernator instance. But again, especially with the configuration options taken out and you know in a YAML file, it should be pretty easy to stand up your own if you'd like to do that. And I think maybe just looking at Gubernator as a template of the like middle ground that we could get to with test grid. I'm not sure where we're like. In an ideal world, it would be really great to say the entire stack of infrastructure that tests Kubernetes itself runs on Kubernetes. Uh, but Kubernetes is an example of App Engine is a PaaS and provides a lot of wonderful things at scale that we would have to re-engineer from scratch in order to run it on Kubernetes. And while that would be a great ecosystem to have on a Kubernetes cluster and we may one day get there, for pragmatic concerns, it just makes more sense to open, make sure that the application itself is open source, but the back end on which it runs is still kind of a proprietary thing. Um, so that that could potentially be one way of getting us out of the, the quagmire of test grid is tangled up in some Google internal things. There may be other components of test grid that we could open source uh, in that manner. Um, can I ask a quick question about that? So. so and I apologize for any echoes. Try that. All right, good. Uh, so my, my question is, so Jenkins, for all of its faults, is at least open source and runs on Kubernetes. And there's Kubernetes, or has, obviously has the App Engine dependency. Has there been, uh, I, and I, I agree with everything you, you said as a preface, I'm not trying to prolong the any ideal controversy. But I guess my, my question is, for the, those that want to run all of the tests on top of Kubernetes, would it be easier to run stuff that's currently on Kubernetes, on Kubernetes, Kubernetes on App Engine, to actually move that to keep that stuff on Jenkins, or actually move some of that functionality onto Jenkins or something else that runs on Kubernetes already? Or do you think that there's just too much there to possibly move that stuff over? Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it's difficult for me to give a diplomatic all non all or nothing answer with Jenkins. I just feel like once you start using Jenkins, it takes a lot of effort to make it usable while locking it down sufficiently to prevent humans from tweaking it and tuning it the way they like to. Um, it's just the overall management of Jenkins can be a pain. So for a smaller team of individuals, it's, it's fine once you scale up to a larger project. Uh, I just, the example I have in my head was OpenStax Jenkins is, is really cool how you can go and see a lot of like read only things, but it took a lot of effort to set that up. And they couldn't really do that effectively until they created Jenkins Job Builder, which is a tool we have tried and kind of run away from as quickly as we can uh, in terms of it, the templates and whatnot sort of balloon pretty quickly. And that's just management of the jobs. That's not even management of the various um, plugins and configuration files for things like that. Justin, hand up. I, I just want to say it depends. I think. I'm not sure what the underlying question there was, but like something that I am discovering is hopefully like within a couple of weeks, once we figure out like some things around test grid build IDs and silly things like that, uh, it will be very easy to run a, an asynchronous job that like runs every hour and reports results into the central Kubernetes test grid, uh, probably using test, uh, kube test and or bootstrap.py, but um, you can do that basically completely separately it should be relatively standalone, able to run in a pod, and you just set it up on your Kubernetes cluster and off it goes. And if you want to, you could run that with Jenkins, but uh, it should, doing that will be very straightforward. And that's totally fine and cool. The little bit of like connectedness is when you click on a red cell in test grid, you're like, oh, that thing failed. Can I go see what failed? It, it Right now, if you click that, it links you through to Kubernetes, right? And so in the world where other people, like we want people to be able to use whatever CI system they have to contribute their results and, and treat Google buckets as the common delimiter there. But for that full integration of, I wanna see more information about this specific test and why it passed or failed, you need to provide some sort of publicly exposed endpoint. And so if you happen to be running your own homegrown Jenkins and are comfortable exposing that to the internet, we can maybe provide customization to allow that to happen. But I think right now it's like, we assume that you're gonna end up clicking through to Gubernator pointed at the same GCS bucket that is driving the test grid results. Uh, yes, but it, so you, it is though possible to set up an additional bucket uh, and submit your results into your own GCS bucket and it shows up fine in test grid if you use a suitable build ID. So that, that works today. Yes. I think, I think one other thing that we noticed a lot with Jenkins as we sort of arm wrestled with it for the last couple of years is it, it, as a developer, when I see a failed test, I want it as quickly as possible and with as few clicks as possible and navigate to what failed and figure out why. Jenkins, even with plugins, even with customization, fails to do that in a clean and concise way. And one of the things we really like about Kubernetes, or at least sort of a simpler approach, um, is we can do that. We can bring out the things that we find valuable. We can take that list of things to highlight and make it what we want. We can show the J unit front and center, like right in your face, and you can't miss it. I think Jenkins, for all it does, I mean, how many times have I had to explain to somebody during onboarding how to actually figure out what happened? It's not, I don't know, it's not like a happy place to be, I guess. Uh, by the way, on the back on the test grid thing for just a second, if it wasn't clear, I was implying there that in order for test grid to pick up your bucket, you need to make sure you modify the config file that then generates the config that that test grid uses, right? So, uh, if you if you haven't seen it already, one of the first one of the early um, uh, recorded meetings here. If you scroll back in the meeting notes, you'll probably find it, or it's available in the Kubernetes YouTube channel under the sync testing playlist. Um, we had a presentation on test grid that was uh, pretty enlightening. Um, some of the information from that has now landed in docs. The readme has been expanded greatly, uh, but we could use, there, there may be more um, just interesting info in the video uh, that might shed some light on how things work and how things are wired up. Recognizing, of course, that that's, you know, a couple weeks old and that's years in this project's timeline. <laughs> A 
Cool. Um, anybody have anything else? Going once. I, yeah. One thing, sorry, I just realized we still haven't quite resolved is, so we've merged a tool to sync labels into test info. Um, it doesn't seem to be currently in use and I'm not entirely certain if we still, if we have like a, a, a path right now to, okay, you need a new label created on this repo. What, what do you do? Because at this moment I've, added the configuration to both Kubernetes main repo and test infra. The labels seem to have been created, but with the wrong color. I, it doesn't seem very clear to me what's going on there. OK. I can, add, I can maybe add some color to that, and I'm happy to be corrected. Um, so the ContribX is probably going to be a meeting where we can, uh, we can talk about that Wednesdays, 930 Pacific. Uh, the effort to standardize labels across all repos is something that that SIG is driving. Um, bit of project history, there is a munger that you can turn on in the munge GitHub instance called check labels, and it will look at that labels.yaml file, and if none of those labels exist, it will automatically create them. I don't know if it creates them with the correct color or not, but that's, that's one way of doing it. Um, that was turned off a while ago for reasons that I don't, I don't actually know. Um, then a little bit later, I sort of noticed that that labels.yaml file existed, but was horrifically out of date as compared to the labels in the repo itself. And I needed some machine readable way of getting labels, and that YAML file was a much faster way for me. I realized it's very close to the format generated by a tool called Labeler, which can both scan GitHub and write that file out, which I think is what I did to, uh, to update it, and also read from that file and write to GitHub. Um, and that's something I have seen, uh, I think Brian Grant has used it once or twice in the past to like manually pull request in changes to labels YAML, and then you can run that tool and it like syncs the labels in the repo. Then separately, there's this effort through ContribX where a tool has been created it's, it's a whole separate program that we want to try running as either a cron job or a scheduled job through Prow. I believe we're looking at cron job. Um, and that program will be used to sync up labels across repos. And rather than like turning it on against every repo, like all 40 plus repos in the Kubernetes org right now, we want to turn it on for just a few repos, for just a few labels make sure it actually works, and then turn it on for the rest. So the actual frequency at which it's run is, I think, TBD. And whether it's actually running is also TBD. It's on my list to look at before tomorrow's ContribX meeting. Did that provide enough color, or did I get anything wrong, anybody? OK, cool. Also, somewhere in there is like, none of the labels are actually documented. Um, so. To me, sometimes it can be a little confusing what all of the labels are actually used for or what they mean. And that's, that's also somewhere in the, um, in the queue on ContribX. Uh, quick question. I dropped a link to a GitHub labeler. Is that the tool you were referring to? Uh, no, I'll find it real fast. Okay. Uh, just a sec. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you for asking that because that's, I mean, a lot of people have a lot of context when we think about it. Uh, yes, that's the tool that I'm talking about that was written, and this is the other thing that I think I have seen folks use in the past. It's it's definitely what I have used to sync the state of the world back to that YAML file when humans went and added labels on their own. I think the the ideal vision is eventually we use that label sync tool and we lock down the repo so humans can't create labels. The YAML file is the only uh, mechanism by which you add labels or remove labels or rename them or change their color or whatever. OK, so right now there's two labels, I believe, in Kubernetes Kubernetes that are miscolored. Obviously, this is a P0. Um, the fix is to wait or to bug somebody? I would uh, probably bug somebody. You'll probably get faster. Yeah. For P0, you got to bug somebody for sure. 
But no, I think like it's if especially if it's just changing color. I believe anybody who has admin access on the repo can do this for you. Um, and if you dig around in GitHub Teams, you can probably find that. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. I say we get three minutes of our lives back. What do you all think? Cool. All right. Happy Tuesday. See you all next week. Later.